Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on Design and Implementation of Human Computer Interfaces lecture number 18 where we will start our discussion on system design. So, before we start we will quickly recap the interactive system development life cycle and then we will uh, understand where we what we discussed and where we are at present. Then from there we will take forward the discussion. So, if you recollect in the interactive system development life cycle there are several stages, some of those stages form some cycles. So, essentially the life cycle contains iterative components as well as some non-iterative components. So, we started our discussion with the requirement gathering analysis and specification stage where we learned about how to create an SRS document or software requirement specification document. In the document we can include both functional requirements as well as non-functional requirements. After the requirement gathering stage we have a cycle which is design, prototype and evaluation cycle. So, there are three sub stages involved here, one is the design stage, one is the prototyping stage and the third one is the evaluation of the prototype that stage. Now, if you may recollect here what we mentioned is that design actually refers to two things, one is interface design and system design or code design. So, we have so far discussed interface design and the cycle refers to design of the interface. So, once we have some design ideas then we create a prototype, get it evaluated and refine our design based on the evaluation results and so on. The cycle continues till we arrive at some stable interface design. Also during this discussion we have learned about how to go for designing an interface, particularly we learned about design guidelines. In prototyping we learned how to make different prototypes ranging from low cost and affordable prototypes to high cost system oriented prototypes. So, there are broadly three types low fidelity, medium fidelity and high fidelity. So, we learned about these different prototypes and how to use them. Also we learned in details about different prototype evaluation techniques we learned about two broad techniques, one is evaluation with experts and evaluation with users with the objective of getting the evaluation done rapidly and without much cost. So, once we arrive at some stable design, then we go for system design where we design the components of the system in modules and sub modules. Now, then that is followed by implementation of the design in the coding and implementation stage. Then comes testing of the code that is another stage, a very important stage. So, after testing we get an executable system. This is followed by a special stage called empirical study where we test the system for usability. So, getting only an executable system is not the goal, our overall goal is to get an usable system. So, we have to conduct empirical study stage. Now, occasionally it may happen that in empirical study we found some problems, usability problems. So, we need to refine our designs, interface designs and the subsequent stages we need to carry out. So, there is a loop from here. but it is very infrequent unlike the design prototype evaluate cycle. So, after we arrive at an executable and usable system we go for deployment followed by maintenance stage that is our overall interactive system development life cycle. Now, in this life cycle we have so far covered requirement gathering stage and interface design stage. In this lecture we are going to take the discussion forward. So, we have covered under interface design stage 
how to design the interface, create prototype as well as evaluate the prototype. So, entire cycle we have covered for interface design and then in this lecture onwards we will take it forward. So, we have learned about interface design issues and guidelines in the earlier lectures and now we are going to discuss once we design an interface how to convert the interface design to the design of a system specifically a software. Note that here in this entire course wherever we use the term system we primarily refer to the software. So, we are going to talk about design of the system which is based on the design of the interface that we arrive at after executing the design prototype evaluate cycle. Now, the design prototype evaluate cycle as I mentioned primarily caters to the interface design aspect of the life cycle. Once we get a stable design, so the design is stabilized that means no further usability issues are discovered or in significant number those issues are discovered after the evaluation stage. So, no further iteration of the cycle is done and we reach at a stable design and then we focus on converting that stable interface design to the design of a system. Now, when we are talking of design of a system, the same two issues come back. What are those two issues? One is where to start and the second one is how to represent. In case of interface design, we encountered the same issues and if you recollect, we discussed that to answer the question where to start the interface design process, we can start with design guidelines. Also our intuition, experience, these can be a starting point. And when we say how to represent interface design, we talked about prototypes to express the design. So, in case of interface design, prototypes can be used to represent the design or essentially that is the design language. So, in case of system design, the same issues are there, where to start and how to represent. Now, the core objective of a system design is to make the final code manageable. What this means? So, when we are saying that we need to go for design of an interface, we are primarily concerned about what the user perceives, what the user gets to see and interact with or gets to perceive and interact with. So, there our primary concern is the user. Now, when we are talking of system design, our primary concern is implementation that is we need to build a software for that we need to write a code and that code how to write it in a way such that it is manageable. Why that issue is important? Generally codes are written in a team for complex systems. Typically complex systems require writing of hundreds of thousands of lines of code. And if single persons are entrusted with this task, then it becomes very difficult and there is possibility of errors, huge number of errors. To address this problem, what happens is that the code is divided into units and different teams are entrusted to develop the units separately and then finally, combine them together to create the whole system. So, that is typically what is called a modular design to manage the overall development process smoothly. So, when we are going for designing the system, we should keep that in mind and try to design it in a modular way, so that, so that when we convert it to code, the modular development is done or is possible. So, our main objective in system design is to help in managing the code development well. And 
help in making the code manageable. So, let us begin with the first question where to start the system design process. Now, earlier in the requirement gathering stage we saw the output is SRS or software requirement specification document. Let us begin with the question where to start. So, we start with the SRS document or software requirement specification document. If you recollect this is the outcome of the requirement gathering analysis and specification stage and we start our system design with this document. Now, when we are going for designing our system, there are broadly two phases. What are those two phases? One is the preliminary design phase, where we go for designing the system at a very high level. So, this is essentially a high level design of the whole system. And then there comes the detailed design phase. Now, in this phase what happens is that we go to the minute details of the system. Now, this is also known as module specification document. So, when we are creating a detailed design document this is also called module specification document. So, in the preliminary stage we design at a high level at the modular level and in detail design stage we go to the minute details of the modules. <coughs> Let us begin with the high level design phase. Let us try to understand what we do at this phase. So, at this level as we earlier mentioned that our whole objective is to make the code manageable for that we need to go for a modular design approach where we can divide the big problem into smaller modules which are easier to manage rather than trying to manage the whole problem at a time. So, at the high level design we start with identification of modules. Also at this level what we do is we try to find out control relationships between the modules and at this level we provide definitions of interfaces between modules. So, modules need to interact with each other, how they interact, what kind of interfaces should be there that definition also we provide at this phase of system design that is high level design phase. The next question then is once we manage to come up with a design how should we represent it so that it becomes easier to understand by others who are going to implement the design. So, what language to use? There are actually many languages which we can take recourse to to implement the design idea, system design idea. Let us see one example. Later on we will see another example. So, this example actually shows one particular language used to represent a high level design, system design. This is called DFT or data flow diagram. As you can see here in this example, so essentially what is happening is that we are using graphical notations. graphical notations to express the design idea. So, it is a graphical language to represent design. There are certain conventions and standards used like any language that we will learn later, but here I want to just give you some idea about the idea of DFD or the idea of graphical languages and how it can be used to express a design. Suppose 
we are asked to design an web based newspaper application. So, essentially we are looking for designing a software which is a newspaper application which is based on an web. So, a user can get the newspaper through a browser. So, what happens is that somebody has designed this system and this is a top level view of the design where this entire circle which contains this text web based newspaper is the representation of the system whole system is represented with this circle here. Then there are some rectangles used which are representing who all can interact with the system, who all are the stakeholders for this system. For example, there can be administrator, there can be a special type of user or there can be some other type of users. Also, it shows how these different stakeholders who are users of the systems can interact with the system in the form of labeled arrows like the ones shown here. So, this arrow is there with a label which shows what data flows and in which direction it flows. For example, administrator can interact with the system in different ways by providing news details, user details, content details, several information, account details, etcetera. A special type of user marked as user share can interact with the system with general discussion, providing feedback, addition of comments and account details. That is how the design is envisaged and then these particular notations are used to represent that design. Similarly, other users can view or search. So, the other users can interact only in with these two ways, other interaction mechanisms are not available to the other users. So, in that way we can indicate who are the users, how they interact and what they interact. So, that is the graphical language. Now, of course, when we are representing the whole system with a single circle that does not convey anything. At a very high level it says that okay, there is this system and there are these users and those users can interact with the systems in so and so manner. But then what is inside the system? What is the design of the system? Same language DFD can be used to represent the lower levels of the design as well although still at a very high level. For example, that circle which represented the whole software can further be expanded in this second level. We will learn about these levels, idea of levels and all these things in a later lecture exclusively on DFD, but right now just to give an idea. So, that software contains several modules as represented with these symbols. One is faculty login module, one is faculty main menu, one is conduct examination menu. So, this is of course, exp uh, not the design of the earlier system, but this is design of some other system which is related to classroom teaching. There is another module on faculty course management. So, these particular symbols are used to represent modules or processes and then there are symbols to represent some databases like the symbols used here rectangles. These represent several databases that are used by the system. So, essentially this is a second level 
representation top level will represent the whole system in the form of a single circle as shown in the previous slide, previous uh, part of the lecture. And if we want to express more details of the design in terms of the modules that are part of this whole software, then we can go for the next level of design using DFD where we can show the modules. Now, these processes will require some data to operate on. So, that database also requires something to represent. So, we can represent it using the rectangles as shown here. Then interaction between modules again in the form of labeled arrows to show the direction and content of interaction. So, all these things can be represented with DFD. We can go to even lower levels. So, one of the modules from the second level can be broken down into sub modules and shown as a separate level of the DFD for that particular system like one third level DFD is shown for the modules shown in the earlier design of the system. Now, it may be noted that the conventions used are the same like to represent process we use this circle, this uh, notation. To represent databases we use this notation, labeled arrows, but this whole thing here is actually representing only one of the modules at the higher level. So, one module is divided into sub module with interaction between them and the databases they use and that is that forms a separate level of DFD. We will learn about all these things in details in a later lecture. So, that is just to give you some idea of how we can express our design in the form of a graphical language. Like DFD there are other languages partly graphical languages are also there. So, later on we will learn about these languages in more details. So, that is about high level design. Note that in the high level design that is where we are talking about modules and their interaction, we are not telling how the modules are implemented. Instead, we are simply saying that okay, in the system there will be these many modules, they will interact with each other in this particular way, in that direction and there will be some databases which provide which will provide data to the module or get data from the modules so on and so forth. Now, in the detailed design phase what we do? We go for detailed design of the modules and sub modules that are part of the overall system. So, here we identify data structures and algorithms that are required for implementing different modules. So, that is the detailed design phase. So, that is in a nutshell what is system design. So, we have two phases of the design. In the first phase we go for designing the high level concepts in the form of modules and their interaction and in the second phase we go for detailed design of the modules in terms of the data structures and algorithms that they require to be implemented. So, once we have a design definitely the question comes whether this is a good design or bad design. So, how do we categorize whether some design is good or bad? So, for that we need to know what characterizes a good design. So, let us see the characteristics that define a good design. First thing is coverage. Now, this particular characteristic tells us that a good design should implement all functionalities that are specified in the SRS. So, you have created a software requirement specification document containing functionalities. When we are going for a system design, the design will be considered to be good if all the functionalities that are there in the SRS are part of the design. If we miss 
some functionalities then this is not a good design. The second characteristic is correctness. That means, a good design should be able to correctly implement all functionalities of SRS. Now, here correctly means that it should be able to produce the desired output when a specific input is given. So, correct implementation of all functionalities is another hallmark of a good design. Third important characteristic is understandability. What it means? Any design, any system design that you come up with and represent using some language should be easily understandable. Now, this is very important. So, the whole idea is that you divide the whole problem into manageable smaller sub problems in the form of modules and sub modules. So, it is not necessary or generally it is not the practice that all the modules and sub modules are implemented by the same team which designed the system. It may happen and which is most often the case that the design is distributed to several teams and they were asked to implement different modules and then finally, those are combined together. So, whenever we are creating a design and expressing it within some with some language, the design should be easily understandable to people who are not part of the design. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to implement the design in a team. So, understandability is very essential characteristic of a good system design where understandability means it should be understandable by other team members who are not the part of design team, but who may be asked to implement it. The fourth characteristic is efficiency. This is another important characteristic. The whole design should be efficient. Now, here efficiency means that the whole design should be made in a way such that it is possible to implement the design idea with efficient usage of available resources. So, a design should not require things that are not available then that is not a good design. So, whenever we are going for designing something, we should be aware of the resources available and accordingly we should design so that those resources are used optimally. Fifth characteristic is maintainability. The design should be amenable to change. So, if there is some change required after brainstorming over the design, it should be easy to do that without having to recreate the whole design from scratch. So, we should be able to conceptualize and represent the design in a manner such that changes can be performed at a local level without having to redo everything in the design. So, those are essential characteristics that define whether we can label a design as a good design or a bad design. If these five characteristics are not there as per our evaluation of the design, then there is a need to refine the design so that these five characteristics are maintained in the final design. So, that gives us some idea of whether our design that we have come up with can be considered to be a good design or a bad design. Now, let us try to understand another important concept in relation to design of a system. Cohesion and coupling, what it is and what are these concepts and how they are related to good designs. As we have repeatedly said 
our goal is to come up with a modular design so that we can distribute the implementation work for faster turnaround time. So, good software design requires clean decomposition of the problem into modules this is very important. We should be able to very clearly and easily decompose the problem into sub problems or modules that is not the only thing also we should be able to neatly arrange the modules in the form of a hierarchy that is also required. Now, whether we will be able to do that, whether we will be able to go for a modular design or not depends on two properties of the design, cohesion and coupling. So, essentially modular design depends on cohesion and coupling. So, let us start with the idea of cohesion. Now, cohesion typically is the property of one module. Whenever we are trying to design a module, it has a property of cohesion. What this property indicates? Several things determine the cohesiveness of a module and there are several types of cohesion. One is logical cohesion that is if all the functions in the module perform similar operations. For example, suppose there are several functions which are part of error handling module. So, essentially their objective is to deal with different types of errors. So, all the functions are performing error handling then we say that this module error handling module is logically cohesive. Then there is temporal cohesion that is if all the functions of a module should be performed in the same time span. For example, whenever a system starts we have defined an initialization module. So, there are several functions as part of the module and those functions initialize several may be data structures or storage elements, databases. So, all the functions are doing the initialization at the same time, time span which is at the beginning of starting of the operations of a system. If that is the case then we say that the module in this case the initialization module is temporally cohesive. Then there is procedural or functional cohesion which indicates or which happens when all functions of a module are part of the same procedure or algorithm. Suppose there is a decoding algorithm used in some image processing task, image processing software. Now, decoding algorithm need not be implemented in the form of a single function. Instead, we can implement it as a group of functions. All are part of the same module of decoding and they are all representing the different parts of the same decoding algorithm. Then, if such a situation exists, then we say that that particular module is functionally or procedurally cohesive. Then we have communication cohesion. It happens when all functions refer to or update the same data structure. As an example, if a set of functions are there that are operating on a linked list data structure, so that means they are referring to the same data structure as well as updating the same data structure, then those functions are said to be having communication cohesion property. And finally, we have sequential cohesion output from one element is input to the next element of the module. For example, the sequence of functions 
get input, validate input and sort input. If these three together form a module, then the output of get input is fed as input to the validate input function, validate input output is fed to the sort input function. So, then they are sequentially cohesive module, then that particular module is called sequentially cohesive because the functions that are part of the module follow the sequential cohesion property. So, essentially this cohesion property is what they say is that a module is a collection of functions and how the functions behave in terms of input or communication between them or execution behavior. So, those behavior of the functions in a module represent the cohesion property of the module and there are 5 types of cohesion depending on how the functions behave. That is about cohesion. Next is the concept of coupling. Now, cohesion is property of a single module. So, the functions that are part of the module. Coupling in contrast is a property between modules. So, when we say coupling, we say that it is a property between two or more modules. Now, there are like cohesion, there are different types of coupling possible. One is data coupling. What it says is that if two modules communicate through a data item, then we say that they are having data coupling property. For example, passing an integer between two modules. So, if we are designing modules in a way such that some integers need to be passed between them, then they are having data coupling property. Then we have control coupling. If data from one module is used to control the flow of instructions in the other module, then we say that there is this property of control coupling. For example, if there is a flag data which we set in one module and that is used to control the flow of operations in some other module, then there is a control coupling between these modules. Then we have content coupling. If two modules share code, then they are said to have content coupling property. For example, branch from one module leads to execution of code in another module. If that is there, then we say that these two modules share the content coupling property. So, to recollect we have these two important concepts which are nothing but properties of modules. One is cohesion which is a property of single module and one is coupling which is property between modules. Now, one important thing that we should note is that high cohesion and low coupling leads to functionally independent modules. So, our objective is to have clean and neat decomposition of problem into modules and we should be able to represent them in a hierarchical manner. Now, that is possible when we have functionally independent modules and that is possible in turn when we have high cohesion within modules and low coupling between modules. So, essentially whether we are able to achieve our goal of a very good modular design depends on whether we have been able to design modules such that the modules have high cohesion and low coupling. If that is satisfied, then we will be able to go for a very nice modular design. Otherwise, it will not be high quality modular design. So, our goal should be to have as little coupling as possible and as high cohesion as possible. So, with that, 
we got some idea of what is the aim of system design, what we need to know and what we should be aware of. Now, next task is to understand how we can go for designing system. So, what are the approaches available? Broadly, there are two approaches. One of these approaches is function oriented approach. In this approach, what we do when we go for design of a system is that we use functions as basic abstractions. So, whole system is designed based on functions. If we are going for such a design, then we call it function oriented design approach. Now, when we are using function oriented design approach, to represent that design we rely on, generally we rely on DFD or data flow diagram, the example that we have seen in the earlier part of this lecture. As I said on DFD we will have detailed discussion later. The other broad approach for system design is called object oriented design. Here instead of function, the basic abstractions that we use are objects, which are instantiation of a concept called class. So, in object oriented design approach, we rely on objects as the basic abstraction or basic unit for design and these objects are instantiation of a concept called class. So, that is the basic idea on which the object oriented design approach works. Here also we rely on some language to express the design, typically we go for UML or unified modeling language to represent the object oriented design of a system. So, in subsequent lectures we shall learn about both these approaches namely procedural approach and DFD as well as object oriented design approach and UML to express those designs. And we will learn those with case studies so that these become easier to understand and remember. So, with that we have come to the end of the lecture. So, in this lecture let us quickly review what we covered. So, we started our discussion on how to go for system design. Now, we learned what is the main idea behind system design and what are the key concerns. So, there are two concerns one is where to start and how to represent. Where to start is basically the SRS document that we got at the end of requirement specification stage that is our starting point. So, our objective is to implement all the functions and to represent we need to make use of different languages. One example we have seen graphical language called DFD and there are other languages as well. Now, design happens in two phases, one is the high level design phase, one is the detailed design phase. While going for design, our main objective is to go for modular design so that the code is manageable. Now, to ensure that we have to ensure that whatever design we have come up with has high cohesion and low coupling. Cohesion and coupling concepts we have discussed including different types of cohesion and different types of coupling and just to emphasize cohesion is the module property whereas, coupling is a property between modules and our objective is to have a design that supports high cohesion within a module and low coupling between modules then only it will be possible to go for a very good modular design otherwise our objective of modular design may be compromised. Then we talked about two broad approaches to design one is function oriented approach other one is object oriented approach. For function oriented approach we need to use DFD to express the design. For object oriented approach we go for UML to express the design. In subsequent lectures we are going to talk about these design approaches as well as the languages to express them 
in more details with case studies for better understanding. So, that is all for this lecture, hope you have enjoyed and learned the concepts. Looking forward to meet you all in the next lecture. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.